Hello again, friends. It's Friday, September 9th, which means, of course, it's time for In Other News, week ending September 9th. And uh, the big news across America that all the Poduck pundits are talking about is, of course, there's all this Republican nomination nonsense and debates going on. And then President Obama came out with some jobs package, blah, 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 probably the 20th one of his administration. And the U.S. still is in a recession. Everything sucks. Yeah, surprise, surprise. It's another election cycle where a bunch of buffoons are talking and making big promises about stuff that will never be enacted. How interesting. Not. What's going on out in the world in other news that is more interesting and more timely and more important for you to know about? A handful of things today, uh, That uh, one of which I reported on in class and that is that Japan this week suffered through like the sixth or seventh or eighth major typhoon of the season. Uh, hurricane season in the Atlantic is uh, typhoon season in the Pacific. And while se several of these typhoons have passed over uh, Taiwan and the Philippines and hit mainland China, Japan has just get been getting body slammed and Typhoon Talus just walloped them over last weekend and even into Monday. And that in of itself is not that big a deal. I mean, I guess it is to the people who got rained on in Japan. Uh, but the reason I bring it up in other news is that also this week, uh, it was reported that the Japanese economy has shrank uh, yet again. I don't even know how many financial quarters in a row this is. But it's keep, it speaks to this bigger issue, which I keep preaching about to classes and anyone who tunes into these podcasts, which is that Japan is a country in some trouble. Now, they're still rich, and they're going to keep being rich. However, they're shrinking. I mean, they're, they're shrinking in uh, economic sense. They're shrinking in a political sense in the world. They're shrinking in importance, quite frankly, in the Asian neighborhood. Uh, and they're just not going to be a major world leader for much longer. It's questionable if they ever really have been since the end of World War II. But they have always held this kind of esteem that they were the most kick-ass economy and the most awesome, richest place in Asia. And that was true for a very long time, and that is simply not true anymore. All these other rising powers in Asia, I'm speaking specifically of Asia, are getting as rich as Japan and aren't nearly in trouble in terms of economic or political stagnation that Japan is. And then you put a typhoon on top of that, right on top of a year for Japan that has seen a major earthquake, a tsunami, nuclear disaster, uh, energy loss, uh, political infighting. The, the uh, sixth prime minister in, in the last five years just stepped into power a week before last. So from multiple angles, Japan is in some trouble, and typhoon season is not making it any nicer for the Japanese. This has been one hell of a year for Japan. 2011, I think I said this in class, 2011, I believe, will go down in the history books. A uh, hundred years from now, people will look at the history of the world or history of certain countries, and 2011 is going to be one of those years that people say, yeah, that was the point at which Japan started declining significantly with these disasters and their nuclear issues and all this other stuff. You heard it here first, if you're still alive in 100 years to read about it in a textbook. Uh, other uh, parts of the world this week that had some serious action going down in, and, and actually it was an earthquake. There was an earthquake in uh, New Delhi, in India. So let's switch over to South Asia. But before the earthquake, actually a more significant event took place, which is a suicide bomber, or actually I don't even know if it was a suicide bomber. I think it was a car bomb. So a terrorist group bombed. Uh, set off a really large bomb outside of what would be the equivalent of uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in India, the Indian Supreme Court, in a very busy kind of government sector part of uh, New Delhi, the capital. Uh, I don't know the casualties and, and the number of wounded. Those numbers never really are that important to me. Suffice to say, it's a very big deal in India. Now, here's why it's a much bigger deal than a single isolated attack. India is in some trouble. Oh, it's a booming economy, a booming population, booming economy. And by the way, I meant to also add that Japan's population is declining along with its economic and political clout. Uh, but India's economy is exploding and doing quite well, and their population is getting bigger, and it's a very vibrant place. But they have significant issues with terrorism that is not really well known or understood in America. Of course, Americans, as a general rule, don't know much about what's going on in the rest of the world, much less India. But India, I mean, we talk about, uh, we still, of course, remember the 9-11 attack here 
in the United States. In fact, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary, 10th recognition of that here in a couple days. And that's still a really big deal in the United States. But the, the fact of the matter is that terrorist attacks occur quite frequently all over the planet. Europe sees a lot all the time. The Middle East, of course, sees tons and tons. Iraq and Afghanistan on a daily basis. Pakistan on a bi-daily basis. Uh, however, what you might not have heard about is this uh, is a big deal for India. And I, I like to bring this story up because India's got to get on the ball here. Uh, India is not a country at war. Uh, it's not a country in a civil war. And yet, they it's not a country that has troops anywhere else that are pissing people off that maybe they would have liked to attack India for. But it, because of its uh, frictional relationship with Pakistan, uh, particularly over Kashmir, uh, uh, India and Pakistan don't like each other. They fought several wars against each other. Uh, there's a lot of animosity between these two countries. That's part of, that plays into part of why there are suicide, terrorist attacks on Indian soul. But there's a whole bunch of other things, too. Uh, I believe that it's an Al-Qaeda-linked group, or uh, it's an Islamic extremist group which has taken credit for this bomb blast in New Delhi. Okay, So I should say that first and foremost. The point I want to make, though, is they ain't alone. It's not kind of business as usual that all the, all the terrorist attacks in India are Islamic extremists. Well, they're a part of it. Um, Islamic extremists are also blowing up stuff next door in Pakistan, in Islamic country. I want to be quick to point that out. But India has more troubles than even just the Islamic extremism uh, because they have folks that blow up stuff for a whole variety of reasons. Um, even economic ones. While there may be Islamic extremism within India that doesn't like, say, the uh, Hindu-led government or doesn't like the way that uh, Islamic folks are treated in India. Uh, there are also folks who just blow up stuff for political reasons over, say, the Kashmir issue. So that's not really a religious thing, that there are people that think that India should give Kashmir back to Pakistan, so the people pissed off about that may blow up stuff in India. That happens too. But also economically, there's a group called the Naxalites. Yeah, Naxalites, like N-A-X-A-L-I-T-E-S. The Naxalites are a Marxist group. They're not Islamic, or maybe they're Hindu, doesn't matter. But they go blow up stuff because they are fighting for equality and fighting against poverty in a kind of a radicalized way. Uh, they maybe want India to turn communist. I don't even know. The point being here, to kind of step it back, the whole general thing is, India has lots of terrorist attacks from lots of different parties for lots of different reasons. And here's the kicker. They're not doing a good job dealing with any of these groups. They got to get on the ball. They are going to be a world power. They should already be more of a world power than they are. But they are going to be one of the major world powers of the 21st century. But not if they don't get a handle on internal domestic turbulence. Uh, they're, again, their economy's doing awesome. They are becoming a political player in lots of international ways. But man, they don't even have control of their backyard. And this is becoming a significant issue that the government of India is starting to take heat over, that they really do not have a coordinated, singular kind of anti-terrorist poli policy, much less a program. They just don't. Uh, they don't have nearly, they don't have a one one millionth of, say, the intelligence gathering about terrorist activities on their own soil than, say, America does. So this is a major issue uh, for India we'll likely hear more about this in the future. I think India is probably going to come out with some gigantic kind of anti-terrorist program very soon. Uh, otherwise, all the people who are in office are going to get their asses unelected. You can't have civilian deaths at this level uh, with no kind of vision of how you're going to handle the problem. And the Indian government does not have one yet. By the way, the United States has kind of been nodding and pushing them, saying, dude, come on. We're, we're your buddy. We're your ally. And... Um, Increasingly so, but you guys got to get on this. Okay, so uh, typhoon in uh, Japan, uh, terrorist attacks, and an earthquake in New Delhi, India. Uh, uh, in Russia, I didn't mean for this to be a death and destruction episode, quite frankly. I'm not. I'm, I'm in a good mood. I'm not trying to report on bad things. But uh, in Russia this week, I believe it was Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, a uh, major airline, major airplane, Russian airplane, went down, crashed and killed all but two people on the plane. Now, plane crashes happen. Again, I don't report on the macabre. I'm not that interested in death numbers. But as always, if I'm talking about it, it speaks to a bigger issue. And the bigger issue here is this particular plane going down in Russia got a whole lot of press 
because a whole bunch of famous Russian hockey players were on it and they died. So this has now become a national tragedy. Any time a plane crashes, it's a tragedy for the people that die. This is now a national tragedy because they had a bunch of national hockey player treasures on this plane. And it's gotten a whole bunch of press, obviously, all over Russia. And it's not even the first major plane crash this year. That's what I want you to know about. The Russian air fleet is in pathetic shape. Dude, all of their planes are from Soviet era. Try to imagine this, that you're getting on an airplane anywhere in America, and no matter where you are, no matter what airport, no matter what airline you get on, no matter what size plane, all of the planes are 30 years old or older. In the entire country. Yeah, I wouldn't feel so safe about flying. And that is increasingly the case in Russia. Their fleet is from the Soviet era. There, there's no, there have been no planes basically built since Russia became the modern state of Russia after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. So it's significant from an infrastructure standpoint that Russia, while it is becoming more powerful, certainly under Vladimir Putin's uh, uh, leadership slash bad assery of the last decade, Russia kind of climbed back into world power status and got its mojo back and got out of a lot of its debt due to oil revenues because Russia exports tons of oil and natural gas. They got rich and they started to get back on their feet. But they ain't out of the woods yet either. They have a long way to go on infrastructure development before they kind of even catch up to being at par with more westernized standards of, or I just I'd say westerner, westernized, uh, developing world standards for, say, roads, uh, airlines, trains, and that sort of thing. Although the train system is pretty decent. So, um, yeah, they got a little ways to go. Russia has been revamping its military in a very big way, trying to catch it up to the 21st century. And it looks like they're going to have to start refocusing on private sector stuff like planes, trains, and automobiles as well. Good luck with that, Medvedev and Putin. Let's stay with Russia for the last one, by the way. That's actually way more important than Russia. Russia's... Uh, aging air fleet. And that is also this week a huge, huge, huge feather in Vladimir Putin's cap. Remember, he was the president of Russia from 2000 to 2008. He's currently the prime minister of Russia. And for all of us Putin followers, we know he kind of is holding all the cards. Yes, uh, President Medvedev is a good guy and he's his own man, but Putin has an inordinate amount of power in Russia and probably will become president again maybe soon. The feather in his cap of this week though was a couple days ago they officially opened the uh, what do they call it the Nord Nord sir what is it the Nord Stream the Nord Stream and what this is is a underwater gas line natural gas line from Russia directly to Germany first time ever first time ever uh, natural gas probably really anything but natural gas has been delivered directly from Russia to Germany, therefore bypassing uh, Poland, which typically all these transit routes would go through Poland. Or when you look at Russia's major exports, natural gas and oil, and tons and tons of both, uh, they go through Poland, Ukraine, lots of places in Eastern Europe to fuel all of the economies of Europe, of particularly Western Europe, but Europe as a whole. So this is the first time that the Russians have bypassed and gone straight to Germany. Now this is a significant story. I, I'm sure you have not heard of it. I'm sure, I know, you guys are too busy. Everyone in America is too busy to pay attention to this. This is a big story. This is a story big enough that the Platt Avenger might be, have to be called out of semi-retirement to talk about. I'm going to kind of give you the highlights real quick. Why would I get so excited about this to suggest this is, this is uh, not a game changer, but it's it's a quarter changer, all right? Not the whole game, but a major part of the game is being changed right now. What am I referring to? Well, the first time that Russia and Germany are hooking up directly for natural gas, cutting out all the uh, Eastern European middlemen. What this does simultaneously uh, is it pisses off the U.S. in a big way, but that's that's a sideline thing. It, it brings Germany and Russia uh, closer and closer together, perhaps the closest these two entities have ever been in history, uh, maybe right up to the lead up to World War II when they signed a non-aggression pact, which of course Hitler then uh, uh, reneged and invaded Russia and got his ass handed to him for it. But this is making Germany and Russia extremely economically tight. How so? 
Germany is an industrial powerhouse. Germany needs power to in order to be an industrial powerhouse. They export lots of large manufacturing items. You think of Germany, you think of cars, but they make everything. They're what America used to be 100 years ago, by the way. One of the reasons why the American economy sucks right now is because we don't make anything anymore. Germany still does. They're as rich as us. They are as advanced as us, but they have maintained their manufacturing and industrial sector jobs. So they produce a lot of stuff which makes them wealthy. But they don't have a lot of energy. In fact, they have none. So they need oil and natural gas, and they are increasingly relying on Russia to get that. Uh, all of Germany, Germany itself, but all of Western Europe relies on Russia for approximately a third of all of their energy. And that just got tighter with this Nord Stream underwater uh, gas line. Again, direct. Pulling these two major Eurasian entities into a stronger and stronger embrace. And of course, that is extremely troubling to the United States. The U.S. fought hard against this even happening and had been pushing for these other routes with other companies and not the Russians. Uh, the other reason why this is important is that Germany, of course, if you follow this website at all, Germany got rid of all its nuclear energy this year, pledged to, which means they're even further reliant on oil and natural gas, which is coming from Russia. So, again, to step back, I'm getting my, my heart's starting to palpitate. I'm getting too excited. So kind of to step back and think about this, Germany and the Uni United States are friends. That's not going to change. But think about how it changes things geopolitically. Is Germany going to be as on board for anything that the United States wants at the UN or in the world or, say, U.S. initiatives in Eastern Europe now that they're even more reliant on the Ruskies? And the answer is, of course not. Of course not. Now, what am I speaking specifically of? Think about that uh, uh, the U.S. and France, I think, and maybe the U.K., were very much trying to get, say, the Ukraine and Georgia to, to join NATO. Uh, and Germany was always on the fence about it. And I can tell you where they are now. They're, of course they're going to be against it. The Ukraine and Georgia will never get into NATO because Germany's in a position of, hey, we can't piss off our Russian friends. And they're not alone. Again, increasingly, all of Europe is relying more and more on Russian oil and natural gas. Russia is perhaps for the first time in its history, getting something it always wanted, which is kind of a presence in Europe, kind of a, 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 a reliable partner of European countries, or if you want to take the negative, that they're becoming an imperial power uh, within the European theater. Uh, you can name it any way you want to. I just want you to know that it's happening. That This is a very, very big deal. Yes, it's just a pipeline carrying natural gas, but it's linking up two of the biggest powers within Eurasia, in a stronger embrace, which is going to affect international relations with everything that's going on in this hood and in the world. Again, it affects strategic relations, not just between Germany and Russia, but U.S. presence and U.S. influence in Europe. Increasingly, European countries, Germany being the first one, are not going to be in a position to be able to piss off the Russians when it comes to, say, an air bay, a U.S. air base, or a U.S. sponsored pipeline, or a U.S. A uh, uh, radar system that's an anti-missile system. You, you start to see again for those of you that know these things I'm referencing. The the balance is starting to be tipped in Russia's favor now that U.S. initiatives are not going to be happening as much, if at all, in Europe because of not just this pipeline, but again, it's symbolic of what's happening here. Oh, by the way, I said this is a a, a feather in Putin's cap because he's the one who pushed it most. He really oversaw this kind of ten-year deal going down that just officially started pumping gas from uh, Russia to Germany. It's not the only one, by the way. The Russians are also working on a southern pipeline to feed down through the Black Sea and over to feed the economies of, say, hell, everywhere from Bulgaria over to Italy in a southern pipeline. And that increasingly looks like it's going forward, too. Uh, there, again, the U.S. is fighting hard against that one, is trying to build alternatives but it looks like the Ruskies are going to win that one too. So again, we're just seeing the beginning of this in increased reliance on Russia within the broader European sphere. Again, they're not going to turn their backs on the United States, but people are going to have to start ponying up and paying more attention and yes, kissing more ass to the Ruskies. Which, by the way, that also happened. Uh, it's not in the news this week, in other news, but uh, UK Prime Minister, British Prime Minister David Cameron is going to Moscow next week to try to shore up better relations because all the other European countries have already been kissing up to the Ruskies. The British have held off because they mostly, uh, for their full-time job, kiss the United States' ass. And that is having to change. That's why he's going to be the guy. 
That's what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> Does that help you understand some more important things that are happening in other parts of the world? Please, please, if you love me at all, don't waste a second of your life watching any of this political BS going on in the United States uh, between these two bickering tribes called Republicans and Democrats, which put them all together in a room and let them do whatever they want. They're not going to finish or accomplish anything at the end of the day, no matter who's in charge of the Congress or the presidency. Uh, pay attention to what's happening in the world. That's where you're going to get smarter and understand more and be more successful. But I didn't mean to get off on a big pep talk about that. That's all I got uh, this week for In Other News. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on the flip side next week.